Greetings. Today I'm going to break down how I made a track called Scepter for my band or alias project called Luo. It's a tune taken off of our album called Unspoken, which is kind of all about the fusion of IDM and electronic rock, that kind of style of things. So this tune is actually named after this Scepter Fox synth, which is what I use to create the main sound. Yeah, it's basically the big brother to the Critter and Guitari pocket piano synth, which I've also got here. Although these were limited edition and they're pretty rare now, I think it's pretty difficult to try and find or pick one of these up secondhand. Yeah, it's pretty simple to break down this track, to be honest. I just got this synth at the time and I think I was just, you know, just messing about <laughs> with the fact that it's got multiple octaves on it. It's got a sound to it, you know? So that's some of the kind of nice stuff that you can get out of this. But yeah, at the time I, I just got my hands on it and I think I just got really latched onto this like sort of, I don't know how exactly I ended up arriving at it, but it's just this simple like octave part thing just going. And um, it counts over in 5-4, so. So I was like, oh, that's kind of interesting. I just kind of got a, a cool kind of weird five bass pattern out of that. Um, and I think I probably started by just recording that in. And I think I was just like, by itself, that sounds a little bit thin and it just sounds a bit weak. So um, I just duplicated the track and then I thought to fatten it up I'll just go through and keep playing the riff with each waveform that is on the pocket piano so you can hear like when I hit this button here so you've got a few waveforms to choose from and they kind of change the tone of it but I was like I'm just going to try layering them all up and kind of see if what happens and see if that kind of fattens the sound out. This is probably not going to sound exactly the same as the album version. Yeah, I made this tune years ago or started it in like 2015, I think. So I can't exactly remember what I would have done or all the steps that I took to kind of arrive at the final bass sound. But this this is like the kind of general idea. So so I've got my volume and my, uh, my pitch control here. And I'm just going to make sure that that is set um, to hard left just to make sure that the set of boxes so that it can, you know, it can reach down to the lowest value or pitch that it can that way. Um, I just kind of want this to be nice and low, so if I just add this layer in now. Next one we get to is the green. So that's our first kind of gritty triangle wave or sawtooth kind of wave sound I think and the next few of these are going to start getting slightly more gnarly and aggressive. Let's do the next one. And I think there's just one more which is this white waveform which is really cool because this one's going to create some sort of weird harmonics and overtones when I kind of start to distort it later on. But yeah, it's still not quite like, it's not quite thick enough. I think it's like, you know, you want that to have a little bit more weight still, right? And just a little bit more aggro. There's a little cheeky hack with the Scepter Fox. If you turn it off and then basically if you hold down this button here, as you power it up, you'll, um, it shifts the entire range of the Scepter Fox down an octave. And you can also do that going up. So now, you know, I can reach that. I can reach these lower sub pitches now. I'm going to add a few like lower octave versions of some of these wave shapes here. It's not all of them, but just some of them. So that now is kind of like the sandwich, the set to sandwich that's kind of got me closer to that fatter bass sound. You know, we can just group all of these together, like with a track stack or in Ableton, you could use a group. And now I can kind of deal with all of that as if it was one track and put more effects on it. So for example, 
let's just put a bunch of effects on that and see kind of what we can get out of it. I can't remember exactly what my signal chain would have been, and I probably would have done a lot to this sound to begin with to eventually get it to where it is in the final tune, but uh, I don't know, let's just try some stuff out here. I feel like I would have put some saturation on it, probably something like, you know, boosting the, the high end of it quite a bit. Like, You can hear there's quite a bit of noise in the signal there. That's something that you could clean up with a gate or noise reduction with a piece of software called Isotope RX. So I think I probably would have put some kind of stereo widening plugins on some of these layers as well. Probably something like there are these two free plugins. One of them is called Dimension Expander by Xfer Records. Yeah, it's this little chicken fella. And um, this is the setting I like to use with it. So if I just... So that can be a nice way to kind of add some fatness to it. And also there's this other plugin called TAL or TAL Chorus. Yeah, this is like an emulation of the chorus that you get on a Roland Juno synth, which is like known for, yeah, it's just really, really fat and wide basically. So I've put that on the whole thing. But I don't think I would have put that on the whole group because it probably would have messed up the central, you know, don't, I don't want to put like a widener on my sub layers. I kind of want those to just stay in the middle. So maybe I'll try that on the, on the purple layer here or something like that. And then I think probably just sending that to something like a reverb, just to give it a little bit of space, probably something, I probably would have used something like this because I like to use this reverb a lot. So. You can hear there's quite a bit of noise in that and it's like, it's quite a trashy sound, certainly not perfect. And you could do a lot to kind of clean it up, sort out some of these rhythmic discrepancies or cue the clicks and stuff and that kind of like hiss or that noise that you can hear on it. But I don't know, I kind of like leaving things not totally cleaned up and a bit messy like this, because I think that does give things, it's a bit of a debate or a conversation to have about that, like what what things are going to be up to your discretion that you think are like intrusive noises that are needed to be gotten rid of or you know versus things that kind of give it a character and then yeah i might have possibly put some sort of like multi glitchy effects on it or something like looperator has got some quite cool distortion presets in it that uh So that's basically just using Looperator for this distortion effect that it's got in it because I like the tone of that and then just sort of using that like a distortion plugin basically on this loop. So I think that kind of... I think it's starting to sound how I kind of remember it being before. <laughs> So the rest of this track came about pretty intuitively, to be honest. Before I went any further with it, I basically just like fiddled around with the Sandbat loop for a while and then created an export of it and then put it into an Ableton session like this. And then I took it into a rehearsal room with one of my good pals called Sam Hughes, who was uh, Luo's drummer at the time. And yeah, we basically just blasted the loop out of a PA in a room and just jammed over it. He was on drums, I was on keys. Uh, and we were also joined by a dude called Vad, who was our like live depping bassist at the time. So, uh... <laughs> I happened to film this kind of rehearsal slash writing session on this old iPod Touch, of all things. Yeah, I recently dug it out of a cupboard and uh, the video is actually still on here. I don't know if you can see that on the camera or not. The screen is a little bit broken and uh, it looks terrible and sounds horrible. But yeah, managed to unearth this clip, which dates back to September 2016, which is pretty cool because that is basically I'm filming this on the 12th of September 2024. So that is almost eight years ago to the day and that's still going, which is quite impressive. But yeah, in this footage, you can see how Sam just kind of lands on this beat intuitively and he seems to just kind of start playing it automatically, which is a bit weird. But we didn't rehearse the tune before this. Like I remember just taking this loop in and then just playing it out in the room and just seeing what everybody came up with.
Yeah, I think it seems to fit really nicely with the loop and it has this perpetual motion thing about it or that kind of cyclical feeling like a 6-8 waltz, but it's got that angularity of the 5-4 measure which kind of makes it a little bit interesting and just has a bit of spiciness to it, but without it feeling like a tune that's in an odd time signature, I think, maybe. So anyway, what I've done is kind of recreated this in Ableton. I've just got the loop in here to kind of talk about uh, the rest of the layers and just kind of talk about how the rest of this gets built up. So I'm just using uh, my addictive drums preset for the time being, just to kind of show off this groove. So the next thing is there's this layer of pocket piano, which is kind of doing an arpeggiator over this Septifox loop. And on this purple mode, which is, I think it's my favorite mode on the pocket piano, if I like hold down a few notes. And um, yeah, this controls the speed, but I'm not gonna worry about that. This second knob here opens up like a filter. You can kind of get the, um, you know, like a brighter tone or kind of do like a filter sweep kind of thing with that knob. And the cool thing about this mode is when, when you're holding an arpeggiator like that, if I hold down that button, it like, it shifts the whole sequence up an octave and just like by occasionally tapping it, you know, you can get some notes to kind of just hit the octave above randomly and just kind of create some nice variations that way. So. But obviously it's nice to be able to control the pocket piano with both hands without having to hold down a chord, which is what you can do with Ableton. So you can see I've got this MIDI region here, which is um, sending these notes to the pocket piano as if I was holding it down, right? So if I just give that a play. So I have this MIDI locked to Ableton's tempo. So that arpeggiator is like bang in time with the, with the pulse, right? And then And then that combined with a bit of Ableton's built-in ping pong delay, which is automatically set up on send B here. And then if I get, so if I go to this delay here, now I've got this ping pong delay set up on the pocket piano and that. So that's really fun. And yeah, if I just kind of like gradually bring this in, fade it up over the uh, drums and the scepter loop, you'll hear how the tune kind of begins to come about. You can see there that what I'm doing is playing additional notes in over the sequence whilst that MIDI's running and it just adds notes to the sequence without disrupting it, which is really fun. So that's the next layer. Um, and then obviously there's the piano chord, which is like another thing that just kind of happened in the studio intuitively. I have no idea why exactly. Well, I do know why. I, pr I did pretty much just hit that chord randomly. You know, it's just one of those like instantaneous things. We were like, oh, that's a vibe and just end up leaning into it. And uh... so the chord is just, yeah, starting off the root note, which is C sharp again. And the left hand is just playing this. It's just the root and the fifth. So like the power chord sort of thing, but. And then uh, my right hand is just playing these four notes here, which is the B, C, D sharp, and the E. So that little cluster there. And I think I've mentioned before in some of my other videos, like I just love these chord shapes where you have like that kind of, you know, two notes next to each other, that semitone thing ringing against each other and that kind of dissonance. just whoa, no. to talk about that for a second what did I just do there 
So in this chord, that relationship, the semitone thing, it's happening on the top of the chord, right? So that's like the highest pitch thing that's happening. So that's the highest moment. But I think you can get a lot of really cool results, you know, if you're messing about with where that that harmonic uh, or that intervallic relationship is like happening in the chord. So here it's at the bottom of the chord rather than being at the top. So well, that's not at all what I played a second ago. What did I play a second ago, Hound? There we go, that's it. Yeah, it's beautiful, right? So. Pretty much my left hand is only ever doing like power chords, that kind of thing. And I really like these, um, I don't know what you call it, like shell voicings, I think they're called or something like that. It's just like two notes, so. Yeah, I guess it's like not playing too much. The fact that it's just this one chord that just holds for so long and it has so much space, it's like, I don't know. I feel like in this tune, it's like there doesn't really need to be that, that many chords. And then the last thing is just this little sort of pad sound, I guess, that I'm using the Scepter Vox for, so. So it has this patch on it, which has just got this like really slow attack. So it's good for pads and. I've stuck a Valhalla Vintage Verb on that just to make it, you know, really ambient. So yeah, it's quite nice for that kind of ambient pad thing. And that just does like a little like into that chord and sort of rings out over it. And then the rest of the tune just proceeds on in that manner and continues to build the intensity over that loop, essentially. So quite a bit of stuff happened between me kind of initially coming up with this idea with Sam and stuff like that, and in between it coming out on the album Unspoken. So Sam, the previous drummer, obviously stepped away from Luo due to other commitments. We were still very good friends, but I ended up joining forces with a musician, songwriter and powerhouse drummer called Barney Sage. And I continued to basically develop the track with him. I've managed to dig out off an old hard drive my original production project for Scepter. You can see some of the dates as far back as 24th of December 2016. Uh, I don't know if there's anything older in here, but yeah, it's pretty old. I originally started and made this tune on uh, a different machine to one that I'm using now and also an old version of Logic. So I'm kind of anticipating that when I try and open this, a bunch of stuff isn't going to work. I'm probably going to be missing a few things and it might end up sounding like pretty different to how it's meant to. But I think I'll just give it a try anyway to see what happens. Okay. Audio files are not found. Uh-oh. One or multiple audio files changed in length. Uh, don't know if that's good. That's compressor. That was an organ. Compressor, compressor, saturate. Yeah, there's a bunch of stuff missing here. Hopefully this isn't going to affect things too much. Yeah, that's messier than I remember it being. There's all these kind of additional percussion layers that I sequenced in over the sort of um, acoustic drums part. So you get this kind of like. Uh, 
yeah, I think these samples all come from like a vengeance pack by the looks of things. All right, so near the top up here, there's these couple of tracks, which would be Barney's kind of like rough demo recording. So it's just like a two mic setup with I think an SM57 and I think an SE, it's like a condenser room mic, I guess, for just a little bit more of a picture of the whole kit. But it's like just a rough recording of the drums and um He would have recorded these in his own studio and then sent them to me with we transfer and then i've banged them in here to kind of just have them sitting alongside all this production to start getting an idea of you know what the acoustic drums could should sort of be doing and also to kind of change the programming or what the layers are happening around it so you can see i've got a lot of stuff in here in this project that's like muted because i might have come up with it before barney recorded the drums for it and then like realizing with that in there that it's like maybe too much stuff is going on or just taking out some of these layers and it's like you know at this stage where you're kind of writing stuff we used to just be like there's not really much point in recording it all properly with loads of mics and kind of going in on it until the part is actually kind of finalized and decided so it's just kind of a rough way of working with it basically so you can hear that this is some of the electronic drums production that I originally had in the middle section here. And um, there's quite a few more layers to this. And particularly you notice that um, the main kick and snare portions are actually coming from samples and the kind of more electronic, you know, sometimes my tunes kind of start out life like this. They kind of start as more electronic music and then it ends up kind of warping or morphing into something else later on. But underneath everything, there's always this kind of, you know, software based production. And yeah, with this section in particular, um, I kind of just wanted it to sound a little bit like a warped style of ambient drum and bass or jungle. And it's actually kind of a vague and a very niche reference to a tune from an old video game called Unreal Tournament 2004, uh, called Facing Worlds, I think. And um, it used to play on this map, which was like a pair of towers on an island floating in space or something. You can see Earth in the background and there's stars and it's just really, really vibey. Um, and I've got a lot of sort of memories for this track because I used to go down internet cafes after school with my mates to play this game and this tune would always come on so um, yeah it's kind of nostalgic for me. And the arpeggiator, the, that tune, the main hook of it, there's this kind of particular synth arpeggiator sound that is really really similar um, to the pocket piano here. Yeah when I got this out of the pocket piano I was like oh that sounds just like that, uh, <laughs> that facing world synth so I thought I'd kind of see if I could cheekily uh, reference that track here and see if anybody got the reference uh, so far nobody has um, but yeah <laughs> so that's kind of it you know i wanted to see if i can kind of capture that atmosphere of um, early kind of 90s jungle i guess but without it actually being that and yeah what else is in there so just in terms of other stuff that's like how did how did you get that um there's this little kit in here of my sort of custom made vocal chops to give you a play of what that sounds like. So, um, so these are all like, um, what's it? So this is a sampler kit that I made myself. It's all a bunch of like vocal cuts and chops from artists and singers that I've recorded myself to featured on Luo tracks. and then I've chopped them up it's here to kind of get that like uh, garagey kind of rave style pitched up vocals and then I can kind of program them in rhythmically with grooves like that. You don't really hear this so much in the actual final version of Scepter. I think it got a little bit buried in the final mix but this is something I like to do or something I used to do in tracks a lot was sort of incorporate these glitchy female vocals and it's kind of maybe a bit of a prominent component of some Luo tracks. Um, I basically used to do this because I couldn't sing or I didn't want to sing in my tunes but I wanted to use vocals uh, so I was like I'll just get samples of it and kind of use them that way but nowadays I actually sing and use my own voice a lot more in my production so but yeah just to give you a play of what's going on there and that kind of yeah additionally contributes to this sort of uh, electronic music jungle kind of ravey sound I guess you know um, 
So you can hear that this is all obviously pretty rough around the edges in terms of the mix and like, yeah, levels and stuff all needs quite a lot of work, but like the general idea and the arrangement of the track is kind of done and yeah, kind of construct it in a project like this first. And then uh, we would have taken this sort of as a session into Brighton Electric to record the drums professionally in a studio properly. <laughs> okay, I'm now attempting to open my original mix session, which again, because I did this on an older machine with a bunch of plugins I don't have access to anymore, it's probably going to sound very different to how it actually does on Spotify. So this is the proper final mix session for Scepter. Yeah, basically at the top here, these are all of Barney's drums that we recorded at Brighton Electric with an engineer called Josh Harrison, aka Hoagie. I think we did two days there and we just exclusively tracked all the drums. I took the recordings home and then continued to mix the album and the tracks this way. So you can see at the top here, these are all of Barney's multi mic drums recorded with a lot more mics. So the kick actually had two mics on it. Just a standard sort of kick in and kick out. Snare's got three mics. So there's an under snare mic and two snare tops. There's a hat microphone. The overheads are a stereo pair, it would seem. Yeah, so that's just one track for the overheads, but a stereo track. Um, and then there's a bunch of room mics and a hall mic here. And then a couple of these weird kind of, I think I should hopefully have a photo of this that I can display in the edit. This is like a really strange, I don't know, it's like one of Hoagie's uh, obscure weird mics that give you a really distorted characteristic and just kind of sound trashy, but blended in with the rest of the kit sound is like really nice. So. Uh, I do have a video out about my sort of approach to mixing acoustic drums and the way I like to go about it in more detail. So check that out if you're interested to know more about that. All the other audio tracks here are stems that I've created or converted from the session that I was showing off before this. So it's all the stuff from the production session that I wanted to carry over into the final mix. And you can see that some of it is kind of, I've ended up muting some layers of it now that I've actually got the fill professionally recorded drums in there just because it kind of ended up being that maybe they're not necessary now. This is a recording of the piano that I apparently did at Brighton Electric just to add to it. I don't know what these are. There's some other things in here that are muted, but didn't make the cut. Jeez, all right, let's turn that down a little bit. <laughs> uh, I think that's some stuff from Bonnie's mini log. Yeah, that's kind of a look at, uh, you know, what these projects look like when they kind of actually develop more into, I guess, the final recorded version or the final mix session. It's kind of what typically some of my sessions look like, although this one is actually not as busy as some others. So the last thing I wanted to talk about today is how we made the video for this track. And this was basically a collaboration between myself, Barney, and another one of my good pals called Josh Harrison. And yes, that is a second Josh Harrison that has worked on this unspoken project, which is slightly confusing. Anyway, we shot everything on a green screen at Barney's rehearsal studio in Bristol and we had the assistance of some friends of his. Yeah we basically just recorded footage of ourselves playing all the instrumental parts in different angles and different configurations like side on to the camera or front on. And just, and just wave your arms around a bit. Move your feet a bit as well George. Okay. <laughs> okay cool. Let's cut there. And then yeah, we basically just turned these shots into silhouettes and combined it with visuals by uh, Josh and we were kind of inspired by or referencing the video for Riding by Yellow Magic Orchestra, which is kind of like old school music video. It's an instrumental track. Uh, there's no lyrics or vocals or anything and it's just kind of like it's basically just the band like flying around in space playing the song and kind of occasionally doing dumb things like shooting lasers out their fingers and kind of just a, a visual way to represent an instrumental tune I guess and um, we were kind of influenced by it just because of this old school look it has like the kind of the quality of the actual quality and the look of the effects and the footage where you have that interlacing, that kind of like, you know, that kind of VHS fuzzy edges thing. Yeah, hopefully like looking at some of these shots, you can kind of see what I mean, like hopefully what we were going for, but a more like kind of modern corrupted 
version of it. The tune scepter is like referencing older music, but I wanted it to be like this kind of more modern, like a distortion or like a corruption of drum and bass or jungle almost is like the idea of it. So some other references were things like in terms of like visual references for this video. They used to be these old dreamscape rave posters. Yeah, it's just sort of like referencing the, these kinds of visual styles and that kind of time period, I think. And yeah, you can kind of see our oh, like allusions to what I guess we would call the, the dreamscape grid. It's not quite the same as like synthwave 80s nostalgia look, although it's just, you know, a grid. But that was more sort of the the kind of visual reference point for Septo is these dreamscape rave posters, to be honest. And then in terms of achieving that kind of old school VHS-y or like, you know, like broken videotape look, that was pretty much all to do with Josh Harrison and this uh, particular effects box that he used, which is the awesomely named Dream Weapon by uh, Tachyons Plus. All of his visuals and all of our green screen footage I sent over to Josh and uh, he basically processed it all through this kind of, it's like an effects pedal for video signals, I guess. So he kind of does the these are some examples of kind of what it would do to footage down here. Kind of what helped us to get some of these textures rather than using like a plugin or something in software to do it. So yeah, they're all kind of legit video distortion effects. But yeah, visuals that he'd made in Resolume combined with our green screen footage both fed through the dream weapon and then back into the edit so we could keep kind of working on it in layers like that. And then yeah, that's just basically how we ended up getting the look of the video really. So it comes from this kind of authentic analog way of doing things, sort of, you know? So I think that's kind of a cool thing about it. I think that's more or less it for how this portion of the track was made and kind of a little insight into sometimes the lengthy process that it can take. But I'm going to wrap this one up here for today. Thanks very much for watching and hopefully catch you in the next one. Take it easy.